with me to John 13, Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 38. I know the words will be on the screen as well. I'll be reading from the NIV. But I'd just like to invite our church family to hear God's word. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So let us receive what God is saying to his church through his word. Thanks, Stephen. Well, good morning, Delco family. It is wonderful to be with you. Uh, my name is Brad G. I'm one of the elders in development here at Delco. And I'm really always thankful. Hey, Steph. Uh, something that a phrase that I have come to really enjoy about Delco is that we are intensely relational. Uh, have you guys heard me say that before? I've, I've, I've taken the saying it lately. We're intensely relational to the point where Casey commented the first time he came that I pointed him out from the stage and like I'm about to point out, I'm so thankful that Noah and Lewis are here. Thanks guys, it's great to have you. Uh, we believe so deeply in the power of relationships. Um, and as somebody who occasionally comes up and preaches, it's wonderful to be able to look around and make eye contact with people that I'm like, oh, I, I know these people and I care about these people. Uh, and, it, and it changes the way you bring the word. Um, but I'm just really thankful. Uh, let's pray as we um, together examine what, what we're going to learn from the Lord today. Heavenly Father, we come before you with deep gratitude you have shown us so much kindness you have shown us so much love um, and the experience of you is something that I would never give up so we thank you for being with us today Jesus I ask that as we read your words here in scripture that anything that I say today would fall away uh, and that, Holy Spirit, your words would take root in our hearts. Um, and anything that you say to us would sprout a good seed. So, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Amen. <laughs> so, as I was preparing for this passage, I found myself really intrigued by this first little phrase, right? Verse 31, when he had gone out. And it, it stuck out to me because anytime you are in scripture and you see things repeated, it's usually something you should pay attention to because at, at this point, they were largely a written culture, but they also still were a very deep storytelling culture. And if you want to get people to, to understand something and remember it, you want to repeat it. And so if we look one verse before in verse 30, we see, so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. And who was the he? Does anybody know who the he was that was going out? We preached on it last week. Who left the body of believers during the final supper? Judas. Judas. Thank you, Jim. Very, very good. So Judas goes out and then one verse later, it repeats itself and says, when he had gone out, and what that's signifying here is that Jesus has been engaging in this ministry for the first 13 and a half chapters of the book of John, 
right? And John continually emphasizes how Jesus is ministering to all of these different people, right? He's ministering to Samaritans. He announces his message to the Samaritans first. He is ministering to the Jews. He is caring for the Pharisees. He's caring for all these different people, trying to call them to himself. He's trying to draw them into relationship to himself. And the whole time there's been these 12 disciples that have faithfully followed him, have faithfully listened to his teachings, have gone out and, and cast out demons and healed people, and they've experienced the multiplication of bread and fish, and they've been with him the whole time. And here in verse 31, we have a very sharp divide in the book of John, right? Before verse 31, Jesus has been ministering to everyone. He's been calling everyone in, his closest disciples and the people who hate him the most. He's been trying to get them to understand that the kingdom of God is within him and that he is the representation of the kingdom of God. But here in verse 31, the final outsider, if you will, although Jesus is trying to make everybody an insider, right? He has a ministry of reconciliation. Those closest to him, those who believe in him the most deeply, he's finally alone with them. And it's in this place, once the final traitor has left, right? Judas is gone. It's in this place that he gives most bluntly what he wants of his followers. And so it's really important that we understand that that this is, this is kind of what Brandon was talking about, the, the people who witness the story of our lives, right? There's only a few people that, that can know everything there is to know about us, right? That, like, that's one of the reasons why marriage is such a powerful thing. It's because there's one person who sees you at your worst, who sees you in the morning when you wake up, at night when you go to bed, over and over and over again until you die. Right? Like, that's one of the reasons marriage is so powerful. And we can only have two or three people that know us that deeply. And so, with those people, we are going to share the most deep things. And here, Jesus shares his most deep message. And it's going to be a, a, a somewhat quick three points. So, the first thing that Jesus tells them is this. That they have this new commandment. They have this new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And if we know anything about the way that Jesus loved them, the deepest form of love that Jesus shows is a sacrificial love, right? When he says this, Jesus is pointing back to all the ways that he has loved the disciples, right? In the midst of the storm, he calmed the storm. In the midst of hunger and need, he multiplied the bread and the fish. In the midst of everyone hurrying him to move faster through his day, we, we have to go heal these people, we have to go do these things. He says, no, no, no. I need you to come away with me to a desolate place and just spend time with our Father and refresh yourselves. Right? Jesus has loved them so deeply and so thoroughly and so sacrificially that he's now saying, that is the thing that I am calling you to do because it's the thing that is going to make you recognizable to the rest of the world. And so the first point is this. Sacrificial love is the foundational ethic of God's kingdom. Sacrificial love is the foundational ethic of God's kingdom. There's nothing else upon which this kingdom is built. And we are called to exemplify that love in our daily lives. Second point is this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But, that's one of the most important buts in scripture. You will follow me afterwards. You will follow me afterward. And the truth of that is this. Jesus is preparing a place for us. Jesus is preparing a place for us. Why is that important? If I'm being called to sacrifice my entire life for the sake of others, it's really important that I know, I have a guarantee that it's all worth it. Right? We, there's, this, ah, there's this cultural trope 
in America that like doing the right thing for no reward is like doing the right thing is its own reward, right? And the, and the truth of the matter is this, that's not true. God constantly throughout scripture says, if you do right by me, if you live in relationship with me, it will be better for you. Your life will be better. Now, what is that better going to look like? Does that mean that you're going to have no pain, no suffering, no trauma, no struggle? No. I think the problem is that in our culture, we have come to identify well-being with no trouble. And that's not how human history has ever worked, right? We might be closer to that in some ways than ever before. We have air conditioning and internal plumbing, and that does make life way better than any other time in human history. But we've lost sight of the fact that the one of the biggest things that we do as humans is figure out what we do with suffering. And when we respond with sacrificial love in light of the suffering in the world around us, that is the greatest witness and testimony to God and his power that we can ever give to the world. When we can go before somebody and say, yeah, my marriage is struggling, my work sucks, I am really frustrated with my kids right now. I, my best friend of X amount of years has betrayed me in this way and I don't know what to do. And yet they see us still loving others and they see us still sacrificing for others. That is the testimony that God is talking about here. That's the testimony that Jesus is calling us towards. And the reality is this, the, there's this beautiful place that we are going to go to spend the rest of our days with Jesus after we die. And we read about it in Revelation, right? At the end of Revelation, Jesus talks about wiping every tear from our eye and that there will be no more pain or suffering. And like, when I think about the new heaven and the new earth, I like to think about a world where I can just look at the world around me and say, I want to climb that mountain and then go do it. And not only do I want to go climb that mountain, but I want to do it with Paul and Mallory. And we have all the time in the world forever to go enjoy climbing that mountain. And when I'm done climbing that mountain, I, you know what? I'm gonna build a boat and I'm gonna go sail the oceans. And I'm gonna invite Casey and Anna and Gary and we're gonna go sail the oceans and we're gonna have a great time and Jesus is gonna be with us the whole time we're doing it. Now, when I'm sacrificially loving and I have a vision of that in my future, for me, I, that, that's something that's worth it. I don't know what, what heaven is gonna be like for all of us. But I have to imagine that doing all of the incredible things we can do on this earth with Jesus literally walking with us as he did in the garden is going to be a pretty awesome place. And it's going to make all of this sacrificial love worth it. So that all sounds nice, right? Like sacrificial love, we should sacrifice for each other, and it's worth it because Jesus is preparing this beautiful place for us. Let's go to the third point. Uh, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I'm going to do it. Peter is so angrily loyal to Jesus, right? Seth, have you ever felt angry and loyal all at the same time? Oh, yeah. Right? Like, it's just this deep, like, I don't even know why I'm feeling this right now, but like, I will do anything for you. Right? I looked at Sadie and Addison and I was just like, I'm not even, I don't even know what I'm going to be angry about yet, but I'll be angry about something someday because I'm so loyal to you. Hi, buddy. Hi. There's my second child and my beautiful wife. Uh, and, 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 and it's that loyalty that Simon Peter has here. And Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Right? And Jordan talked about this a little bit last week, that at this point of the dinner, people are probably still thinking like, oh, you talked about somebody betraying you? It's probably this guy. The guy you just said is going to betray me. Right? Like, it's a pretty clear indicator. Hmm, somebody's going to betray me. And then five minutes later, Casey... Before the rooster crows three times tonight, you're going to betray me. It's like, oh man, I don't think we can trust Casey that much. Jeez. Point number three, Jesus' plans don't always make sense. 
in parentheses, to us right now. Right? Jesus' plans make sense. I, I promise I'm not a heretic. But Jesus' plans don't always make sense to us right now. Right? Peter had this vision of Jesus reigning right here, right now. Right? And I would hope that at this point he had started to give up the militaristic view of overthrowing Rome. He probably still held on to that as this like wish, but hopefully he had gotten through his thick skull like, well, maybe Jesus' kingdom looks a little different than I thought it would. But he still thought it was going to be right here, right now. And he couldn't understand that when he said, I'm going somewhere you can't follow, he was talking about death. He was talking about the ultimate sacrifice on Peter's behalf. Jesus' plans do not always make sense to us. And so as we move throughout our days, we have to continually focus on pieces number one and two, even as option number three doesn't always vibe with us, right? Because how many times do we look at the things in our life and go, I don't get what's happening right now, right? How many times in our lives have we looked around and said, I've been doing all the right things, and yet everything in the world around me doesn't make any sense. My world is in chaos, and God, if you're real, I need you to show up right now. Because I've been struggling with this for, for two, four, six years. I've had this wild trauma happen, and I, I don't know if I can keep going in the midst of this storm. Yet in the midst of those storms, we have an opportunity to say, Jesus, I'm scared, I need help. Will you please calm the storm? And I'm gonna to choose to continue to live a life of sacrificial love. And I'll, I'll end with this. How you respond to difficult situations is the most important thing about you. Because it's in those moments where you can choose Jesus or you can choose yourself. You can choose Jesus' way of loving sacrificially, no matter the, the circumstances you are in, or you can choose your own pathway of what you think is right in the world. Well, I've been treated poorly, and so I deserve X, Y, and Z. I didn't deserve to have this happen to me, so I can act however I want. Or we can choose the way of Jesus. So let's bow our heads uh, and we'll move into a time of reflection. I'll, I'll lead us in prayer before that. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to know you more deeply. We thank you for the passages like this where it feels pretty obvious what you're calling us to do. Be with us as we spend some time in reflection, Lord. Be with us as we draw near to you. Amen. Uh, as we move into our time of reflection, uh, three simple things. Spend some time in prayer. Talk to Jesus. You don't have to say Lord. Lord is a formal word. If you want to say Dad, if you want to say Jesus, if you want to pray the Holy Spirit, um, those are totally fine. Lord, make me aware of the places I can show sacrificial love in this upcoming week. And not necessarily that he makes you aware right now of something in the future, like that would be cool if he did that. But like the goal is to cultivate an awareness so that like this is a prayer you could pray every morning. Jesus, help me be aware today for the next 18 hours of being awake. Make me aware of where I can show sacrificial love to my family, to my friends, to my coworkers. And that's something you can pray today. Uh, number two, you can spend some time in reflection. When was a time in my life that I experienced sacrificial love? Right, let's go back to being intensely relational. One of the reasons we believe in an intensity of relationship here is that it's really easy to, set, to practice sacrificial love for people that you know and love. And just like anything else, being sacrificially loving is something you have to work at. 
and it's a muscle that you have to work out. And it's a lot easier to practice with the lightweights of loving somebody like Steven Anderson. Right? It's pretty easy to sacrificially love like a guy like Steven, right? Mostly because he is so sacrificially loving towards all of us. And so if we practice here in our body, sacrificially loving one another, it's going to be a lot easier to sacrificially love that coworker who just is the worst. You guys have those? I've never had one. I, I have perfect coworkers. So reflect on a time that you've experienced sacrificial love. Write it down, write, like write down the weather that it was that day. Be as descriptive as possible. Describe it because I always talk about this. It's so important that we remember our stories. It's so important because it, it draws us, it, it, it draws together the line of our lives so that who I was back then is still who I am now. Even as I've changed, there's this reality that has continued throughout. And if I was worth sacrificially loving by my friend 10 months ago, 10 years ago, then maybe I'm still worth sacrificially loving. Does that make sense? Why we reflect on these stories? Uh, and finally, act. Uh, I think we'll always have this up here. Uh, I can't imagine something different. Um, come forward for prayer. Um, I will be up here. Uh, Chris will be up here and Stephen will be up here um, ready to pray for you guys. So if you feel something stirring in your heart, if you're frustrated about something, if you're excited about something, if you're scared about something, come on up. We'll pray about it. We'll ask Jesus for guidance and wisdom. Uh, we'd love to share that. So Caroline, if you could start playing some music, we'll uh, move into our time of response.